Okay, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Please share where you're, where you're watching from. Uh, I'll try to say hi. Uh, today, I want to do something uh, new, as always. Uh, so this the format of this session is basically, I'm the clueless partner of GPT-4, and uh, we try to pick up a new area of coding, new programming language, new algorithm, something that I've not done before. And we'll see how far we get in two hours with uh, basically the help of, of ChatGPT to build some code, to explore some uh, protocol, to uh, try to visualize something. Uh, the last two times we built a Chrome extension that sends data to um, uh, OpenAI, um, the GPT API to uh, extract entities and relationships. And then we um, send it to NeoFJ to build a knowledge graph. So you could basically select uh, text on a, uh, on a web page. And then uh, let me actually show you where it lives. And then you could um, uh, github.com. And then on my GitHub repos, of which I have made too many, I have uh, JetGPT coding. And here's the Chrome extension, uh, basically, which we built on the a, on a first time, like a month ago, uh, with a lot of help. Uh, where I select some text and then it extracts the entities from the text and sends it to Neo4j for uh, creating a knowledge graph. The second time, actually, we, we built something else. Uh, the second time, let me see. we built uh, the uh, streamlet uh, data. Uh, so if you want to see the live streams of these, they should also be on YouTube. Uh, so if you look at live videos here, um, this was uh, the one where we built a streamlet app, uh, where we basically took some data, starting out with CSV uh, for some EDA, some uh, charts and, and, and uh, drawing things. Uh, then replacing the CSV files with data from Neo4j, and uh, then uh, using uh, scikit-learn to predict uh, some attributes of the data, which worked so-so, but I hadn't worked stream, uh, used Streamlit before, and I hadn't used uh, scikit-learn for uh, predictions before. So that was a lot of learning for me. Actually, these sessions are mostly <laughs> learning for me. Um, anyway, um, what we are... Uh, what do you want to do today? Uh, or before I start with this, I have usually, um, I'll bring up, uh, Simon has uh, written this article that I always try to uh, cite, which is uh, AI enhanced development makes me more ambitious with projects. Basically, you don't need to do all the research and the fiddling and the going deep into the docs, finding out something uh, uh, very particular, Forgetting about some, you know, some specific browser API or so, some core stuff or some, you know, specific things, headers and, and other stuff. You basically uh, have this dialogue with GPT-4 and it, it helps you kind of figuring things out as such. All right. Um, cool. So much for the, uh, it's a really nice uh, article. I can uh, also share this in, in chat. And... Um, uh, I really like, so Simon has a lot of content on LLMs and, and, and so on, uh, which is quite interesting. Recently, he talked more about prompt in injection and how you can, pre can prevent it. I can also uh, uh, recommend the deep learning course uh, from Deep Learning AI, uh, which was really nice. Um, the, the prompt engineering course, I took this and... Uh, because I've been spending lots of time on prompt engineering and, and things like that, I didn't learn too much, but it was a nice intro to the API and, and certain tips and tricks, uh, how you can actually uh, use that uh, as such. So basically, if, you, if you're interested in, in this kind of learning, then it's a short video course. It's like takes a hour or two on, on 2X. Uh, and it has actually built in Jupyter Notebooks, which is really nice as well. So you can basically, you get a free open AI key and you can, uh, uh, so it's initializing the notebooks right here. 
And while it's kind of talking in the introduction, and then when you have the notebooks, uh, as you can see here, uh, then you can basically execute uh, the Jupyter Notebooks. And with the Jupyter Notebook, you can then uh, basically test out the, the prompt completion. So for instance, here, uh, it gives you actually provides an open AI key, so you don't have to pay for yourself, basically, to try this out. And then you can, uh, it defines a, a, a Python function here to get a completion, where basically you pass in for the user role uh, the prompt, uh, which is provided here as text, and models GPT-3.5 Turbo, uh, because most people don't have GPT-4 access yet, including me, so I'm still waiting. And, um, and then it basically creates a uh, completion with the temperature zero, so it should be very accurate here. Temperature one is kind of much more random. And then you get can just provide it the text, and that's the prompt that it's about, right? So, and, and then basically this is the prompt to the model, and that, that's the injected text. So here you already see one tip, always um, surround your text by some delimiters, whatever they are, uh, you can basically tell the model what the delimiters are, but it also figures it out uh, itself. That helps a little bit with prompt injection, but if someone knows what your limiters are, of course you can put them in and then you would need to sanitize the text from the users first before before you um, put it in. And then if you run this, uh, uh, if you run this uh, code, uh, then it basically generates things a little bit and then it uh, provides the output, let's see. If it works, oh yeah, just yeah, answer basically, right? So uh, this is our text, and then it's the summarization of this longer text, right? And so that was a pretty nice course, uh, so that I can pretty recommend. Uh, also, how to build a chatbot, how to expand from a starting point text, how to transform text. Also, translations are in here as well, inference and and, and so on. So that was nice. Um, I can put in the, uh, uh, the URL for this one, I think, into the chat as well. Let's see. Uh, yep. Uh, so that was nice. Um, I've been playing around on, on Blue Sky, so I got an invite from a friend uh, last week, last Friday or so. So I've been uh, playing around with Blue Sky a, a bit and, and uh, spent too much time there. Uh, what's really nice there is it's a very friendly uh, user community. There's no, so far I've not seen trolls or harassment or aggression or people being mean to each other like on Twitter uh, these days. And so it's basically lots of adult people with a lot of uh, people from underrepresented minorities as well from the trans and uh, uh, people of color um, communities as well, interacting a lot, friendly, having fun, and uh, it's very active as such, right? So uh, you have like people around the world sharing pictures of themselves, uh, sometimes naked, uh, but not so much actually. <laughs> and um, and what I uh, came across, uh, so Jess started to work on this perhaps like a week ago or something like that. So he started to work on an, a social graph of uh, of the blue sky. Uh, interactions. And that's something that I want to look at today. So he wrote it, uh, all his code in Go, and I'm not a Go coder or fan so much. So we'll probably use uh, GPT-4 a lot to do Go, uh, Go, Go understanding as well. And I just want to play around and see how far we can, can get to reproduce some of what he's doing. Um, I can also show you what I've done so far with Neo4j uh, at the beginning, but then I really want to dive into see uh, what the the add proto, um, protocol um, gives us in terms of like endpoints, concepts, and so on, and then we can uh, use it. Um, so what, what Jess put together is uh, actually two things. So he built a bunch of tools that can um, collect data from uh, add proto uh, feeds, uh, basically. So you have like user information, but you also have uh, feeds, basically, and then uh, from that uh, feed data, which are all the posts and all the interactions, it uh, basically provides, uh, collects all the data, and then he uses that to create an interaction graph. And what I mean with interaction graph is the following. Uh, he has, so he has collected all the data stored in Postgres right now, 
and he has basically created this interaction graph where there's a subset of the 55,000 users now. Um, and, uh, and this subset is basically the people that interacted, right? And, and, and what he did here is basically to look at how often the two people exchange posts or skeets, as, as they might be called. Uh, might or not be <laughs> might or might not be called. Um, so um, basically, when, pe when people interact uh, with others, then this is kind of an interaction. And kind of the number of interaction create this kind of interaction uh, graph or inter uh, interaction representation, right? And you see, of course, because language, because interests, and, and so on, there are already clusters forming. So you have a lot of people on the on the outside rim that have like tiny mini interactions where like one, two, three, five, ten people interact with each other, but not much with the with the outside. You have language clusters uh, or uh, people from certain countries like Brazilian, uh, Korean language, Japanese is as well here. Uh, a whole cluster, Persian, uh, Turkish, uh, and then in the English cluster, uh, you have then also like the trans community. <laughs> There's an ALF. There was an ALF meme and health thread yesterday. Um, uh, there's some accounts uh, which are like this one is an uh, LLM as well, which generates stuff, Web3 stuff. Um, but there's also like news organizations and, and other things, right? So there's, for instance, um, uh, Jack Tepper is on Mastodon, uh, sorry, on, on Blue Sky. But I need to find his uh, username because something I'll show you in a bit. Uh, so it's basically just, just uh, check Tepper at Blue Sky Social. And you can basically see uh, whom he indexed with, right? So it's basically, let's see if this works. So it worked for me at least. And uh, there we are. Here you see Jack Tepper interacting with all people from all around the other clusters, right? So he's basically posting some news builds, but also some personal things, uh, his doc and and, uh, and other things as well, which is kind of fun. And AOC is uh, also there. And she has uh, recently done an AMA. And so she in interacted with a lot of people as well and is posting usually interesting things and opinions as such. I'm there as well. So my domain, so what's interesting about uh, the proto is you have like, you can get the official username. Like for me, it's misery at uh, dot plus guy, uh, dot social. But yet you can also put in your own domain because it runs on top of something that's called distributed identifiers. And uh, so the identity uh, is basically every user has Oh, so sorry. So this is the add protocol documentation, and uh, in the add protocol documentation, we can basically look at different aspects of the of the protocol. And so one aspect of the protocol is uh, identity. So what is the user identity, right? So someone uh, provides uh, global distributed identities. It's a PKI system, and um, these keys are used for discovering users, seeing what alternative identities that they have and uh, they are, uh, you can use uh, domain names uh, like this here uh, uh, in the um, as as identities uh, but underlying is these kind of distributed identity uh, identifiers here right so you have basically DID PLC which is uh, the lexicon um, and then uh, the um, uh, the the ID uh, as such, right? And so you basically have a DNS lookup uh, where you add a text, um, add a text uh, a DNS entry, and then it gives you back like the DID document. Actually, that's something that we can look at directly. So if uh, let's see if I do look at my DNS entry, so I can say txt at proto dot and it gives me back my DID, right? And with this, I can then go and, and fetch certain information as such, right? Uh, so which we look at in, in a second. Uh, so this gives me my, my initial uh, uh, distributed ID, but then behind this is actually a full-fledged record that has lots of additional information as such, right? And so you basically... Um, 
they're replicated available and uh, they can be rotated as such, right? And um, you can resolve uh, these handles either with a text entry in your DNS, or you can have a callback uh, method which returns some JSON uh, that actually returns your DID, and then you basically get get the the thing back. All right. Uh, the whole ad protocol is running on uh, XRPC. Uh, so it's basically um, a number of repositories, uh, of data repositories, which contain something like users, interactions, and, and so on. And then basically uh, it uses uh, HTTPS and XRPC to communicate between the federated servers, right? So there can be, currently there's blue sky and a number of like small personal experimental um, repositories, but in the future, the idea is to have lots of different ones where even organizations or people can host their own as well. And uh, where basically this data is exchanged uh, through the ad protocol between the different uh, repositories, right? And uh, what's interesting, they created their own uh, schema approach, which is called Lexicon. Um, and the Lexicon is basically like a data um, data schema for certain aspects, like for instance, users or likes or, or uh, posts and, and, and things like that, right? And uh, so for instance, there's the ad protocol lexicon uh, for interacting with uh, users here, resolve handle. Uh, and then there's also one, there's a number of lexica from, from Blue Sky, which are like, give me definition, give, give me the feed. Uh, as such, and, and and so on. So you see which kind of um, inputs and outputs are required and what it, what they are, right? So your eyes here, the author record, and then you say you get like formats uh, and, and, and so on, right? So you, for instance, have the, the author and pointer to a basic view, and then you basically can look at the, in the schema uh, what is the uh, basic view as such. Right, so if I look then at uh, Biscay Actor, then you have like the basic view, profile basic view here. Then you have, that's basically what's in the response. Okay. Um, but if you continue to look at the protocol, uh, so we have these uh, lexica, which def def define uh, data types and interactions. And then it's basically um, distributed uh, by having lots of like small world representations of repositories like users and other things, and then uh, large scale things like uh, likes and so on are basically and search is handled on an crawled central index. Uh, what's interesting as well, in the future, there will be al algorithmic choice. So you basically right now you have your followers and like what's hot, which is a little super basic, what has a certain number of likes uh, on the plus guy. So you basically have here um, following and then uh, what's hard is basically just what's, what's happening right now. Right. And, um, and in the future, there will be the option to have other algorithms as well. You can even bring your own, uh, for instance, if you're interested in certain topics or keywords or, or want to filter out certain things, then you can basically uh, do this as well. Okay. Uh, so Ashwa, uh, the Jupyter notebook with the ML things, uh, we probably should talk about this separately because otherwise I'll get distracted from my current one. Um, but in general, you can look at uh, the GDS client. So if you Google or look at uh, GDS uh, client near for j uh, and there's documentation for that. And then you can basically use that uh, to interact with Neo4j. And it has uh, methods for reading and writing data to the, to the graph. And uh, you can use this for, for your ML things. OK, um, reach mod moderation and, and so on. Uh, we probably don't want to look into this right now. So what I want to look at today is um, Jess's uh, tools a little bit. Um, so I cloned this repository. And he has uh, both the data collector here, as well as a number of individual commands. And we can look at these individual commands and have uh, ChatGPT help us with the Go stuff. Right? 
Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, GPT-4, today we want uh, to understand and code a bit uh, in Go and uh, explore the at protocol. Uh, can you summarize the at proto protocol in five? Parts? Are the core concepts and um, okay, let's see. Okay, I think it made 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 it up, right? Or okay. Let's see what it can do with the domain. Oops, not followers, but um, protocol overview. Um, here we are. Okay. Okay, so it doesn't know anything about the ad protocol, obviously, right? Okay, so what you can do is actually you can take uh, this, this is the authenticated transfer protocol, ATP, and just send this to ChatGPT. Um, Okay, so I pasted the text and now it basically summarizes more or less the text, right? So, um, which is useful, but uh, it seems that uh, GPT-4 with the cutoff date in September, 2021 has not consumed much of the uh, ATP uh, as such. Okay, this will be fun, I guess. <laughs> so I think it's mostly Go understanding that uh, GPT-4 help, can help us with today. Um, so what I was looking at is um, if you look at, um, oh, let's take a step back. Um, uh, Eric uh, posted this um, atlas here, right? And you can interact with it and, and find things. But of course, uh, being Neo4j, I also wanted to kind of import this into Neo4j and see what we can, what we can do here, right? Um, so what we can do is uh, we can uh, create a new Neo4j instance. Uh, let's do this. Okay. Uh, new instance, free. Uh, confirm, download, copy, continue. So, and for some reason, a lot of my instances are gone, uh, which I don't really understand. Okay. Um, okay, so this is my new test instance. And what I want to do is I uh, created, um, so Eric's uh, UI here, uh, or visualization, um, actually uses, um, a JSON file 
that it loads from from a CDN. So if I open this uh, page again, I'll see that uh, it has this exported graph minified, um, which I can open in a new tab. And it's a big JSON file, of course. And in, in here, we have um, the clusters that are rendered initially, but we also have uh, nodes in here. So we have like different people. And for each node, we have a key, uh, a label, which is kind of the name, uh, the size of the node, the area of the node, uh, color of the node, x, y coordinates, because it's pre-layouted and which community it belongs to, right? And, um, and then we also have edges, the relationship, um, which I put it on. And for each edge, we have source and target. And as attributes, we have something like uh, weight and size here. Right? So this should be pretty simple to input into Neo4j. So on Saturday or so, uh, shortly after I got access, or I saw this for the first time, I wrote a small um, Neo4j script to pull this into Neo4j. And this is what we can try to do uh, today. Or oh, that, that's what we can try to do uh, right now. Um, let's see our password. And so this is our empty database. There's, there's nothing in there yet. And uh, what we can do here now is um, in our GitHub gist, which I can also paste into the stream. Here, what I do is basically first I create a unique constraint for the user with on, on the key, and then we create an index for the label, right? So that's uh, piece number one, uh, which should be straightforward. And, uh, and then we can, uh, as the next thing, um, we would load the file. Uh, and what we can actually try out is kind of just to look at, at the file a little bit. Uh, so we have our file here, uh, epochlo.json, and we get some nodes and uh, return and we limit 20 or so, right? So it gets 20 of the user nodes. And so we fetch the file and then we see for each user node, so this is using just JSON pass to reach into the JSON and then extract it. Uh, incrementally. So for each of the nodes, we actually see the attributes that we just talked about, like right? uh, ID, label. So this one has no label. I don't know why. Uh, but the other ones have a label. And then a color and XY coordinates for layouts and so on, right? So which is nice and which now allows us uh, to load our uh, user data from, from this. So what I do is basically um, I get users. And when I merge them in, it sets the uh, attributes. Uh, I need to remove the key uh, from from those attributes because it's duplicate, and sometimes they are not the same. I don't know why, uh, but I just want to make sure that it's not overriding the key that we just merged our user on. Right. So this is our code that we're going to run, and we batch it so that it's not overloading uh, the transaction sizes uh, for our instance. So we, exactly what we just fetched, uh, we create a user for the key and then on create, when the user is, doesn't exist yet, we set the attributes except for the key attribute, uh, this one here, right? And that's it. And we iterated in batches of 10,000 uh, rows per transaction. And after a few seconds, uh, it should, we can actually check how many nodes we have in here. Uh, oh, it's already done. So it created 16,000 nodes. Uh, so we can refresh this as well. So it has 16,000 nodes. And uh, it took seven seconds, and we, it did two batches uh, uh, of 10,000 each. Right? So, so we have our nodes in here. So we can now also click on the user. And these are the users that we see uh, where we can also find ourselves or myself. And dot label uh, contains, let's see. And this is my node, and but of course all these nodes have no relationships right now, and so we can't do anything with them. So if I use look at AOC, uh, then we have uh, Alexandria. Uh, what has your code has here? 
and some other folks because of the contains. Right? Okay, but this doesn't have relationships yet. Uh, so what you want to do next is uh, fetching the relationships into Neo4j, which looks very similar. Uh, so we do the same JSON lookup, um, but this time fetch the edges. And then we find the source node and the target node uh, for the user, um, merge the interacted relationship on the key, just in case there are multiple interacted relationships, and then uh, on create. And we set the attributes. This time we don't need to filter out the key because this time there's no key attribute in the, um, in the, uh, in the attributes entry. Right. So, and uh, we can actually see, check how many edges are there in the, in the data. Um, let's see, if we just run this. Oh, it's already done. So it's 107,000 relationships. And you need to remember uh, there are more users in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the network, in the app, and also more interactions, of course, but it only exports are the users that have at least two or three interactions. Uh, so there's a min weight uh, as well in terms of how many interactions do you have to be added to the graph. Otherwise, it would be just a hairball. And, and so with like this min interactions, you actually get something that's that's useful. All right, so now we have 107,000 relationships here as well. And we can see as well what interactions we have. Can actually find myself again and ca can see uh, what kind of interactions do I have. And it's basically... Uh, what you've seen before in, in the visualization, in the atlas, uh, basically the, the interactions. Let me just disable this. Okay. Uh, so I had uh, a bunch of them like with different people. Uh, Jay, the founder, uh, uh, someone who did a really nice uh, YouTube walkthrough of the ad protocol, um, Josh Long, uh, Lenny Rajinsky from Lenny's podcast, AOC, and uh, Matt Stratton was with Ivan, right? And you can also look at these, oops, you can also look at these uh, here, right? And Ellie Ward for ologies as well. Okay, and uh, so we have our data now in Neo4j, and can start working with this and exploit. So you also see like here are the other interactions, but not all of them are basically shown because for some of them, the weights are uh, too low basically. So you see weight two as the minimum weight here that it has, right? Okay, um, and just to show you what we can do with this is now uh, basically uh, if we uh, look at Explorer, we can actually, um, color and style uh, these users uh, based on attributes. So for instance, we can uh, uh, color them by community, right? Uh, actually, we should actually first load the... So show me a graph shows, shows a minimum graph of, of, of uh, users as such, right? And uh, if you fetch all the users, which is 10,000 users, I think, right? Uh, then we get a very colorful thing here. And if you have the user interactions, we should get something that's more useful. So we probably can also just expand our users as well, and then it fetches a little bit more data. So while it's doing this, hopefully in the background, uh, we can use another style-based rule, uh, not just the community, but also the size of the node. Um, at this as well. Uh, and it hangs a little bit, I think, from fetching the data. Not sure why. Ah, there it is. Um, and uh, we can add another style-based ruling, basically the size or the area. So we can basically say size, range. And then we want to can refresh the range and say the smallest one is 0.02. To a point to five, and then you can basically apply this to the size, and you see now that the uses are differently sized. You could also use the area. Um, I'm not sure if that's better. Probably area is better, right? 
So in your already see uh, a little bit these clusters uh, appearing for relationships. You can also use uh, this size as rule-based for weight, I think. And say the range is from two to 4,000, right? So, and we can say that the smallest one is really small and the biggest one goes all the way to four. And then we apply to size. So many of these relationships now get much thinner and smaller. Um, so they are not overlaying so much anymore. So you already see this is uh, a nice representation of our of our users. And we can, there's a number of nodes which are not connected here. So what you can do is basically we can dismiss the single nodes. Uh, and this leaves our cluster here. And then uh, we could do th find things like, oh, OK, I want to find the shortest path between this user and this user over here. Uh, and then we can say uh, path, shortest path, and then it would find us the shortest path between the two as such. I hope there's one, uh, but there should be one if they're all connected. Um, the other thing that we can do here is because remember, there is an uh, coded information uh, in, the, in the data uh, as well. So we can actually uh, use the X and Y coordinates uh, to uh, represent uh, the data here as well. And then it looks actually quite similar to the visualization that uh, Jay created um, as well. Right? So we could probably make the relationships even thinner so they are not so prevalent uh, and fetch a little bit more data as well. But you see that is actually, so this is kind of the, which one is this the one down there? Uh, this is the uh, Japanese language supercluster, the Brazilian supercluster is to the left, the English one is in the middle. But you see, we can uh, basically, this is the Brazilian one, that's the Japanese, this is the English one. And so we can actually uh, use that to, uh, to do this. Right? Uh, so this is kind of just fetching the existing data uh, that uh, uh, Jess has already collected and represented as a graph. So he, he did all the hard work for us. Uh, into Neo4j and, and, and using that here. So we didn't even need to use uh, GPT for that. Uh, but that's how you can get an existing data set uh, that someone else pu has published and get this uh, yourself. But what I wanted to actually look into today is like at Proto and how can we, we interact with the APIs, with the XRPC APIs and everything else, right? So to go into this, we go back uh, to Jess's repository. And he has in this repository, just the graph builder um, in here. And it basically the, the graph builder takes the data that is uh, collected and turns it into this aggregated format and generates the JSON file, basically, such. Right? So you can start it with Docker Compose. You have to provide, provide an um, authentication for the API, uh, but that's basically about it. And what I wanted to see is he also had this bunch of um, tools around uh, um, or si simple commands around uh, the API. And uh, so I wanted to look at kind of how is, can you interact with the API. Hey, John, good to see you. I'll be in London next week. Perhaps we can find some time uh, to meet. That would be good. Um, so I just cloned the repository. And uh, here, just need to use the other VS code. I'll just move this over. Um, so this is the repository. Uh, I hope you can read this. Should be fine, actually. And um, inside the repository, we have basically uh, Docker Compose for the collector. It uses Postgres, so I just run uh, also started Postgres on uh, with Docker as well. But I wanted to see is basically there was one command that was get users, which I was interested in, right? Uh, so I um, had this command here. And there's a lot of, uh, as usual in Go, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, ceremony around things, right? So uh, what we can actually try to use uh, ChatGPT for is to get uh, some explanation for that. Uh, can you explain uh, this Go code to me? So, again. And let's see. Uh, 
Okay, it gets the, the users from, from the ad protocol and writes it to a handles txt. So it's basically all, all the users. And um, what it did is uh, you get some packages. I think one package I wanted to look at is the um, XRPC wrapper package. And uh, because that's his own, and then probably uh, the ad proto package uh, or the ad proto uh, repository. Uh, let's see. So Indigo is a um, uh, Go source code for the uh, ad proto services. And it's also includes an AP, uh, API. So it's from the Blue Sky team uh, themselves. And um, <laughs> see, it <laughs> even it says uh, this is not ATP, like adenosine trace phosphate from biology, energy, uh, or the add command. So if you're as old um, as I am, uh, John probably knows like the modem uh, AT commands that you could send to your modem to connect to a dial up service. Right. Um, uh, so basically, uh, this the protocol definition. That's what you looked at. Uh, that's the overview, and then there's a blog post, and they have like tools and APIs uh, in here. So I'm not sure how much docs they have for the um, Go API as such. I just saw that um, you can uh, basically run them uh, and, and use them from your Go code, uh, like uh, like just did. Right. OK, uh, so let's see if uh, ChatGPT finished our explanation. So it imports the necessary packages um, that it needs for HTTP requests, JSON decoding, rate limiting, progress bar synchronization, defines a DID lookup uh, structure to unmodulate JSON response, from the server, and then get handle is basically takes in DID and as input and retrieves the associated handle by getting an HTTP get request to the PLC uh, directory and then uses a rate limiter. Okay. And the main function is sets up the rate limiter 10 requests per second, progress bar, and fetches a list of DIDs uh, from ATP uh, what repos. Uh, okay, and then retrieves the handles for each, each DID in the list. It sports a new goal routine asynchronously for the get handle, and then uh, uses a channel weight group. Uh, uses a channel, and then uses weight group, collect handles, and write them out. Uh, and pens them to a slice they have to file. Okay. Okay, so if you look back here, so it says the main function, uh, where's main? Pretty big, yeah. Uh, creates an XRPC client. If the client doesn't be, can't be acquired, then it panics. Here's the rate limiters. Uh, actually, see, it actually understood it wrongly to because it's 50 per second, I think. Or the comment is outdated, it could also be. Um, and then uh, sets a, a template for the progress bar here. And then for the limiter, uh, it basically waits until it does the next command. And then synchronous repo, that's what I probably want to look into from the protocol and then gets the client cursor uh, because I don't really know which repo uh, if this comment proto is saying that it's only user repos. And then we take the repo output and get the repos and get the uh, DIDs here from the repo DID. And then uh, continues. Yeah, so it basically has a list of uh, strings for the DIDs as such, right? Okay, and then out, uh, updates the um, progress bar as such. Cool. So what's interesting, the most interesting thing here is I think the synchronous repos and the repo output. So repo output is the struct, I think. Uh, uh, so we have 
uh, command proto. So we can probably look at uh, Oh, sorry, command prod is com at proto, stupid me. And uh, what I wanted to look at is the simplest repos, right? Here in, in main. Let's see uh, here. Uh, API at proto uh, sync. Repos. Provide sync list. Ah, oh, there. Uh, so the output struct is basically the uh, output is the number of repos. And here's a cursor. Uh, but it doesn't really say. So it gets the repos <laughs> from. Uh, for all the uh, from from plus guy, and then basically gets the uh, DIDs from from those repos, right? Repo.did. So there's an uh, repos uh, struct here, and it has a DID basically in here. Okay, and and that's what it's getting. And then what's interesting is basically um, it. Um, creates a channel and a weight group uh, here. This is what uh, ChatGPT found. This is our channel. Uh, it's the length of the channel is the length of the DID list. And uh, so it's basically asynchronously uh, creates a uh, go function, an async function, and uh, a go routine. Uh, and then basically for each DID, it does the call to handle. And then uh, it basically output uh, outputs that to the channel here. Yeah. And it then kind of waits until all the goal routines are done, uh, the waiting group, and then closes the channel and gets the handles from each DID handle, uh, each handle structure from the from the channel, right? And then writes it to the file. OK, easy enough. Uh, what I saw here in the get handle function is actually this uh, HTTPS call, which I wanted to try on the command line, actually. so. If you do um, curl on this, uh, and we use our DID like mine, uh, so then it probably doesn't work. But if you use uh, this DID, let's see if it then works. So from our, oh nice, I got the data. Big dot and curl dot dash s. Um, so this is now my personal DID. Verification method. Uh, so it talked about PKI and, and key rotation earlier. So they, these are like rotation keys. This is my alias that I'm added my own domain with the text record. And then that's the personal data server is uh, Blue Sky Social as such. So this is where it came from, the PDS. Right? And, and so what it basically does for the list repos is basically gets all the handles and then for each of the handle writes out uh, this data structure. right? So because I said that my, uh, so I, we could, could run this, uh, but I probably want to limit this um, to uh, a subset. So question is, um, if we, uh, if you just run this, it would fetch every everything, right? So, I, but what I what I thought we could do is probably could break um, if the uh, output length is um, greater than x, right? So if you say uh, if uh, length of the output repos is greater than one thousand or one hundred, uh, break. And so we basically stop after 100 users. And then it should also do the get handle and write out the data to file. And then when I now use, uh, let's see, um, here. Um, where did I have it? Uh, 
Uh, so we are currently in in the CMD folder, and we had get users. And if I do go run main go, hopefully I didn't break anything. And this is kind of the uh, progress bar, and it basically gets to a hundred users. Let's see. Oh no, my code was wrong. Did I save it? Oh, I of course looked at the wrong thing. I wanted to look at the list, not uh, DIDs. So, did anyone pay attention <laughs> and tell me what I did wrong? <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, so this is now the length of the DIDs that it fetches from here. So how are we actually in time? We are one minute, one hour in. So we already got some stuff done, and it seems uh, that it didn't like our second change either. So let's see. Um, if length DID greater than hundred break, why? Uh, does it not stop here? Uh, any ideas? But we can just add ChatGPT. Um, uh, why does this code not abort a go for loop? Hmm. So if the DRD loop is, so this is an endless loop, right? Hmm. Uh, so we can probably print out the lengths of the DRDs, right? Uh, Okay. Ah, 1,000. Oops. Hmm. It stopped our, after 1,000. Now we have our handles here. Okay. Hmm. But I really want to understand why it didn't stop after 100. Is it in the repo that there are more in there? So count of DIDs is already 1,000. Why does it not break? Hmm. It's an empty list at the beginning. It adds 1,000 and then it should immediately. Oh, I know what it is. It actually stopped. Uh, uh, stopping after. Uh, okay. I think it um, did the stop after uh, 100, but it fetches like 1,000 at once from the repository. Okay, so our Go code was not wrong. It just had a different um, amount of data that it fetched. Cool. So this could be already used uh, that we get the user. So we can basically fill, fill in our user graph uh, with this uh, get users command, uh, which is nice. So the next thing that we need is uh, find uh, the interactions, right? So because now we have like all the handles for the people in our handles txt. Uh, so let's just finish it really quickly. Um, because of the rate limiters of, of 
either 10 per second or 50 per second. It's probably rather 10 per second, really. Uh, uh, so we have now, it's the same handles, but it's basically, you can turn them into Unix. Uh, sword handles, pipe, unique, uh, pipe, uh, handle 60, swallow two. Uh, so we have one, oh, 1,000 handles, which should be enough for us, us now. So it's, now the question is how to actually get the um, how to get the data from. Gee, I could put myself into the corner here, so I don't put in so much uh, space. Um, so now the question is how to get the interactions, right? Uh, so I'm not sure if uh, Jess had anything in his repository in the, uh, in the readme. Uh, not really. Uh, project in the repo, interactions of users of the platform. So we looked at get users. Uh, there's bin to bin, which is Binary graph reader, bin to text, okay. Graph builder, graph dev, text to SQL light. Um, read graph, write SQL light. I think we should rewrite this all to Neo4j. <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, because there's also an official Go driver for Neo4j, so we could write this directly from Neo4j when fetching it from the. So that's probably. Let's see how far we get. <laughs> Perhaps you can do this. This would be fun. Um, Actually, perhaps we should do this here that we could actually write it into uh, to get users. We could actually, instead of writing to a file, we could write them uh, to, uh, to Neo4j instead. I think I want to try this. Should we try this? Any options, opinion? Because I haven't used the Go driver for Neo4j myself. Uh, so uh, I just move get users to uh, import users. Okay. And now I will need some help from uh, ChatGPT, I think, for. So. Uh, so we have our cat handles here, and uh, we also want to add uh, near for J. Uh, give me an example of using the near for J Go driver to add a user node a graph from a list of handles at user nodes. Okay, let's see. So if we first uh, get the, the driver, should get V5 probably, right? Uh, A driver session. I know that the new drivers should have come out. Uh, oh, sorry, GitHub. Com uh, near for J, near for J Go driver. Let's see. Uh, so we did the go get. And the MVP is driver with context, context background, insert item. Uh, driver with context is the driver, and then execute query, which is actually execute write. Uh, so we can probably use this example. Uh, uh, 
So we can, because that's a new API, and uh, of course, GPT doesn't know about the API yet. Uh, can you rewrite your code using this new driver, driver API? Shortest form possible. I really don't like Go because it's so verbose. Even the MVP Hello World is like gigantic as you could see, right? So it's, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> so much. Um... So let's see. I'm not sure. Oh, if this works. Okay. So let's see. Uh, we have um, our end file for, that we got from the EFOJ. Um, can you use Home downloads uh, new for J. Um, yeah, FC should be the one. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, new for J password, new for J URI. Uh, uh, can you use environment variables for Neo4j UI? Yeah. Okay. So while it's doing this, we can basically uh, get our inputs going uh, in our code. So this is now import users, right? Where's import users? Yeah. Uh, import users. So we add our imports here, context part we already have. So we just need to add the new driver. Uh, then we need to add our connection information and create user is basically this. Um, so this would create one user at a time, which I don't really want. I want to uh, create all users at once, create users. And then uh, our type is probably in the string list here. Does it look like this? I think so, right? So what is handles? Uh, handles is a string. So, and then handles, and we just, because it's just 10,000 or so, we can just, it like this, unwind handles, handle, create user. We don't call it handle, but we call it key, uh, label. Uh, and we just merge the user, right? Um, so this, we pass in the context and the user. 
And then we have the code to import users. Uh, this is this here. Um, okay, this is all very verbose code. Uh, we probably just do it like this. Let's just copy this main function and rename it into import users. So uh, import users. Uh, so the handles. And then uh, we just get the less inf, inf, um, and uh, driver close, and then our handles we get from the outside. And then we just call create users handles, so we don't need the individual one. Uh, fail to create users. Um, probably just want to see the other one. And then we don't need the else. Created user nodes. And then we just use len of handles. And so, and then we basically just do, uh, it closes the driver and then, so it writes here, it writes the stuff to the, uh, to a file. Uh, and then actually, uh, so here handles is also a string array, DIDs, and handles is also a string list, right? So, okay. And then receive the handles, and then finish, and then just writes into file. And here we do, uh, at the same time, well, at the end we say import users, uh, handles um, and don't actually throw do we throw an error panic yeah uh, not sure if this code is correct but if uh, not no then uh, failed importing users into Neo4j. And we said here format printf, right? So, okay. I hope this should work. So we now need to source our um, file. I always forget, I always wanted to... No. I always forget what's the command and get in last argument. Um, actually, we can ask ChatGPT this uh, what is the uh, variable for the last and argue dollar underscore so if I do this and uh, put dollar underscore it's empty Okay. Hmm. Of the 
Chips. <lacht> If you not test, it's um okay, let's try this again. Uh echo this is a test and then exclamation mark. I think it didn't really work right. Okay, anyway, uh, that was just, <laughs> uh, we are in import users, uh, go run. Uh, I did something wrong. Context, I probably just used an equal sign here. All this import users, this main func import users plural. 24, 24. Um, no new variables on the left side of I guess, but it doesn't return anything else, right? So, yeah. Hmm. Okay, uh, why does this let's see. Okay, I learned something about Go. I didn't know the difference between assignment operators and um, okay. And two hundred two is the same problem. Uh, and input users return, doesn't return anything, right? Does it return anything? Um, And so. Probably really bad our handling. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's see. So does the uh, lookups again? And then hopefully, if my source and everything was correct, we should basically see these users imported into our neo for j database. Um, let's see, currently we have 13, 16,000 users, but they are most likely parts. Uh, okay. 
if this works, then we can actually fetch from from uh, from add proto directly to Neo 4 which is nice. So we could also, in principle, whenever we fetch a handle here uh, in the async function, uh, we could do uh, writing the writing to Neo4j directly as well, right? So I'm not sure if that's a good decision to combine uh, the fetch and write because if either of them fails, it also fails. But uh, you would save this all this extra code uh, to send data around. And it could do it asynchronously as well, right? So we could do it also asynchronously here in the get handle as such. So this get handle, by the way, also verifies, right? So if one of these DIDs doesn't resolve, uh, then it wouldn't add the handle to the channel as such, right? Which is actually a good thing. And um, yep. So let's see if this works. Uh, it failed with some error message, which I can't send. Six three nine. No. Uh, your I scheme is not supported. So I username password. So for whatever reason, always get enf didn't get our stuff. Weird. Uh, can we try a new file? So, uh, then just this OS. I'm actually not sure if package main works up there because our file is now called test. Yes, and then we just uh, here as well. Never written go good code, as you can see. Uh, and then we just use, yeah. So run test it go. I do underscore. It doesn't complain. We we'll need to do something else to export them. Why don't we just ask ChatGPT? Uh, why does source 
So what, what I try to do is just source to environment variables and uh, not export the variables. Like Hmm. I don't want to really export each of the variables in the script. I think I'll just use source and then just export them manually. Export new for J UI UI equals I can just use export new for J UI. Username, that's password, and then just run our. Okay, now it works. Okay, so it was my bad for not running using source correctly. Okay, so we run our uh, script again. Um, a little bit unfortunate because it takes a while to fetch all the handles, uh, but I just want to make sure that it works throughout. Okay. Um, anyway, while it's running, the other thing that I wanted to look into is uh, basically how it fetches the interactions, right? Uh, so, which is not obvious to me, right? So, I would say we look into the graph builder and see how it uh, tries to build out all things, right? Okay, install export pipeline trace provider UL scheme WebSocket. Subscribe repos. I think that's an async listen uh, pass for uh, repos. So whenever users or interactions are added, it fetches them. So that's probably how it gets the uh, interactions actually. And then uh, writes the binary graph file. And registry DB connection string, that's kind of the Postgres uh, one. And then int events, uh, int events, beast, new beast guy. So where does this come from? So that comes probably from the here from events. So there's a package events, which probably wraps something. Events. Repo record B sky here. The state of the social graph authenticated RPG, uh, XRPC -X client. So that's the graph. Uh, Cache for profiling, duration, repo, record, queue, and workers. I hear new post guy. A new structure uh, sets the caches, sets the registry from the uh, Postgres. And then it says include links, yes or no, it creates a new graph, and then uh, creates a worker for repo records. And then for generate creates workers. And each of them gets their own XRPC client and, and a mutex for exclusion. Ah, here, interesting. And repo commit, so you can probably imagine them a little bit like Git repository. So when something gets added to an uh, add proto repository, you get a commit event. So similar to the GitHub 
uh, event APIs. Okay, uh, it reads uh, the repo. What's the repo actually? This is the event and repo dot. Oh, so that's another one of the Indigo. Uh, It's interesting that they use CBOR. I, I learned about CBOR as an uh, serialization format from uh, from Chris a while ago. So, and it has these commits. And in our code, we said just had here repo dot read repo from care. This here, here. It's in context in reader, um, gets a block store and returns an open repo. Oh, okay, so it returns a repo. So we get the repo back. RR is in read repo. And so because it's in read repository. Um, uh, so we have a repository now. And then for the repository for RR, uh, we get our uh, events. Uh, so events is this commit. Uh, event dot blocks. Uh, okay. What is the parameter here in the reader? Okay. Okay, and then uh, there are different uh, actions of the event. So we get either an create record or update record, or the other ones are ignored. Okay. Um, grab the record. So this API is pretty low level. Right? So uh, I'm not sure uh, if he did it for like performance or to kind of play around with the APIs. Um, so it gets the record from the event, um, from the repository. And uh, operation path, and if it, if, got, if it got the record, then it checks that the CID matches the CID in the event. It's interesting. I'm not sure what error condition uh, would happen if they don't match. Perhaps if there's something broken in some chains or so. Okay, and if they don't match, uh, if they match. It uh, uses, uh, oops, sorry. This is the lexicon type, lexutil, lexlink. Where is lexutil coming from? Is uh, also coming from indigo, lexutil. Um, lex and in util there is this and then there's our oh, lex utils lexicon util oh okay and there's a type decoder type name for field hmm this is probably uh, generated from the uh, type definitions. And that's on record. This is the record that we got from here. Um, and then it uh, tries to turn it into JSON. Uh, Marshall JSON. And then when we have the JSON, uh, we can JSON byte area and marshal it into a feed post. And the feed post should also be from here, I think, right? Um, which is basically lexicon type 
uh, created at embedded an embed entities facets reply on text. And it basically turns this into an to the queue and it uses its own repo record here. It's its own. We have the context, uh, the feed post, positive name, op path, event time. And then from the queue, it basically it's uh, then consuming them. So and repo record is uh, this type, which has all the information we just looked at, like context, feed post, um, up path, and, and, and so on. Right. So uh, basically, in, in feed post, we have the event. So there's. It seems uh, that at least Jazz is not using an API to proactively fetch the events, but he registers basically an, a listener on. Uh, the um, on the um, on the API and then whenever there's a uh, commit on this, uh, then uh, it gets called. The only thing that I don't actually know is where it actually uh, does the registration of this handle repo commit, if there's an interface or something. Type B sky is track, new B sky. Ah, here. No, that's the post registry. RPC client worker client. But I don't see explicitly where he registers uh, with the API. Interesting. Anyway, where are we half an hour in? So basically that's what is used uh, to fetch, uh, to get the callbacks as such. And um, if you look at the graph builder again, um, Include links, binary file, registry. Yeah, this new piece guy is what we, this was the event handler, right? Uh, that we just looked at and then it basically is running uh, and then uh, gets a binary graph writer and reads the, the file. And it uh, basically has this channel inside of the events. Uh, So here we had our channel for the Biscay uh, report record queue. And um, if this is kind of used somewhere else, worker.go in fetching. Ah, okay, this fetches now the, so each worker, has a ticker here, refresh, authenticating, auth token, auth ticker stop. Um, so it's, it's an async refresh thing. And it's also an endless for loop, yeah. And so it has basically a two operations quit and uh, Refresh. So fetch from the queue and then process the record. And the process record probably just writes it to the binary file and to the uh, to the database as well. So it extracts the um, the, the users, the authors. And then the text as well. So Biscar has solved profile. Um, this is resolve profile here. Uh, 
Puffer Cash. And then workers expire after client mutex actor get profile. So you oh there's also a function in the and in the base in the in the plus API to, to get and profile from the DID basically. You have to pass in your XRPC client and context. And then uh, release lock. So it doesn't, you need to lock the, the uh, client and then release the lock again. Okay, that's kind of just getting the profile information and adding it to a cache. Right. It's pretty sophisticated code for just generating a uh, social graph, so pretty. Pretty impressive. That's like production level code. So my code would have been <laughs> much simpler and less robust than this one. Right. So this has caching built in, uh, tracing built in as well, and uh, updating profile information for the caches as well. Really nice. Uh, so we were at uh, the import. Um, Henry Pokomet, we already did this. And the other one was in Graph Builder. So we have the end events, just to tick on stop. Sync weight groups. That's kind of Prometheus. Uh, tracing, handle repo stream if it, if it try, repo stream callbacks, and save graph. So the thing that I've not seen yet, where were we just now before? We had event callbacks, that was the new B sky, handle repo commit which adds it to the uh, repo record queue and worker.go. And then it processes from, from the queue. Uh, we did the post uh, resolution uh, tracing at events, decode facets, uh, so also handle and uh, post facets and probably also entities. So mentions, links, uh, come from here, and then time from the event as well. Um, get a text, replace them all with backslash n backslash t, okay. And then get the op path from the repository, take all the parts, and then it tries to find probably the replies or something like that. Path parts. So if it's an apply and if uh, it has a parent, it gets URI, uh, process the relation. That's probably where it counts the uh, author and reply to URI. Uh, so that's probably something that I want to look at as well. Um, this one. So it's in worker. Uh, so this is our author, and this is the parent post UI, and then uh, resolves the post. Um, so gets the post uh, that it applies to. And here you have the parent author handle, and uh, here it adds a node to the graph for the author and a node to the graph for the parent. And it should also add a load node to the graph Exactly, a relationship uh, between the two, right? So uh, the social graph concept here, or the social graph is um, basically just a representation of DID and handle, and then has just an edge count as such. And then on the graph, you do the clustering and all the other stuff as well, right? Okay. Um, so 
So this was this process. Relation. Increment reply counter. So it got the parent author handle, reply counter. It's a global counter probably, right? It's a global thing. Just a metric. Uh, gets the relationship. It's a typo here. Um, The search coming from hmm. plot URLs, parts, parent ID is the last element. I wonder why he doesn't take it from the isn't this the parent ID already? Oh, so the, oh, that's the pen ID. Um, if it's not the last one, it basically sets the root ID, the parent ID and the root ID. Um, but it goes just one level up, right? Um, OK, so that's the apply bit. Then it handles quotes uh, or embeds. Um, and the embeds is uh, basically takes the also and uses the same process relation that we already looked at. Um, and quote counter, quote relationship. So uh, you can also increase uh, your interactions if you have more quotes from someone. Good to know. If you want to game your <laughs> game your interactions, then you just increase. And then um, so write a post to the post registry if enabled. So that's kind of two postgres, right? So it creates a post uh, from here. And then uh, parent post ID, root post ID, embeds, parent relationship. And then adds the author and adds the post to the post registry. So, post registry is uh, post post registry is um, here in search and. This is post structure and our author is here somewhere, also the idea and handle. So we have a text, we have a parent, our root, uh, metadata, uh, Boolean and parent relationship. And it just basically writes it to Postgres, right? And so what we could do here is actually uh, create, I'd also write it to Neo4j in, in this place. So we don't need to do it in the other places. Um, and uh, here you see add post. Um, or we can just add Neo4j as an additional thing uh, to uh, to write to uh, alternatively, right? So instead of Postgres, uh, we use uh, another registry here and write it to Neo4j instead. So we can basically keep. Uh, the um, statements and everything the same. So uh, if you look at what, what does he do here, um, uh, it creates a user table with the ID and handle, a post table with text and so on. And then uh, it has, uh, the post has an author. And I don't think it has the other things. Uh, no, the other relationships uh, are just handled here as characters. And then if I do at post, it inserts into the user. 
Um, so there's an insert query here. Uh, add author has this, um, but it doesn't keep like reply to and at least I don't see the replies. So that's a pure uh, user posted something uh, database. So it doesn't have replies or other, other things in here, which is kind of sad. Get authors by handle, get thread view is basically just in var length. Right. Uh, so in, in Cypher, it would be like a single line of, of Cypher instead of an CTE. Right. Okay, so it would be nice if we could extend this to add uh, the connections as well. Uh, so not just the po uh, in the post, not just have the um, parent post ID and, and, and so on, but also have like replies and embeds as well. Uh, so uh, mentions uh, and so on. So um, in workers, where is workers? Um, that protest uh, like the embed. There's only one embed, it seems, right? Um, but here it has for relations uh, for the quotes and mentions. Where is it? This is the parent relationship. That's the embed. Where's the mentions process repo record? Mentions links errors here. Um, so it also doesn't keep the links, which is kind of sad. I did, at least I didn't see it. And the mentions are locked out. Um, but I can't see it's a lock message with the links. Uh, and dimensions. We also just built the lock message. So this is what I would change is basically I also would kind of write to the database. Um, the um, would also write this to the database as well. And the embeds, uh, the mentions, the links uh, would be nice to write them to, to the database as well. So that was, would be something I, I would like to add. Here, All right, so we can basically add to 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 this to write to today. So okay, uh, we just ran this in the background while I looked at all the other code. And if you now look at only for the instance, it has three six nine and seventeen. So it added a bunch of new users, um, as such. Right? Uh, so actually, the code worked. So what, what I would do here, uh, perhaps I'll do it on the weekend or so. I'll try to uh, add a uh, commit writer that also uh, for Neo4j instead of Postgres in the first place for posts and embeddings, uh, posts and authors, and then extend uh, the, um, the structures to also keep mentions and links and embeds as uh, authors, right? So because uh, this process relation, uh, like reply to and, and, and things like that, this should also be um in there uh, as well right so in currently it has a parent relationship right uh, uh, but and parent post ID and root post ID so that's kind of the, the parent link so that's something that we could already get so we would get, get a tree but we wouldn't see who's mentioned or who is um, um, what embeds uh, are used, basically, if the embed has an UI as well, right? Links and embeds, I would also kind of pull out as such. 
and add this to the post structures. And then the database can choose to store it or not store it as such. And it probably would also make sense to somehow, but my go foo is really weak, uh, is to actually move these structures out of the search package here. Oops, uh, move it out of the search package so that they are also usable with other uh, databases and then uh, turn this into something that's kind of dynamic uh, as such. So we would have to have like an interface or something like that for this uh, for this module. Um, but initially, I could just do a Neo4j version of it. I'll I'll talk to uh, Jess about it. Cool. Um, any questions? So we're almost at time. We managed to write uh, stuff to Neo4j, and uh, what I also did in the background, I try to run uh, Docker Compose. So I started a Postgres instance here. Um, so PSQL. Uh, Okay, show this. Uh, was it here? Yeah, okay, there's no table yet. Um, so I tried to run this with Docker Compose here, but it said it couldn't find uh, the locking, locking plug, plugin Loki. Uh, let's see. Probably look at the double compose file as well. Uh, so drivers low key. Low well. Can I just comment this out? Okay. Let's see. Exporting layers, creating, and then it says Loki not found. Yeah, so I just commented out the Loki thing. Let's see if this works. Uh, and I'll compose this. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. That's in Grafana. Hey, David. <laughs> uh, okay. 
So while it's doing this, you can basically now look at uh, if you have any tables now. Um, Uh, so now that we have the logging logi driver again, we can probably also uh, So, but it now should actually, so it doesn't like, uh, should, should, should use the same network, but I always forget the syntax. How can we create a network uh, in uh, compose and use? We probably need to give Okay. Network. And then let's say networks my custom network. We just call it uh, B Sky Network. I can also call it just Skynet. Um, and then I have to add it to the image. Um, And then I need to provide it to the Docker and uh, to the Postgres as well. Okay. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. Is there like a force or so on force car? Let's go. So killing this container. I think I just want to 
you start okay okay we probably need to create a network again when docker is started okay this and then Folks, uh, did I do something wrong? Ah, yeah. So pretty sophisticated project I just built here um, with all the moving parts. Really, really impressive. Cool. This was was interesting. Uh, we didn't build so much, but learn a lot. So at least I learned a lot. Uh, the only thing that I didn't find was where exactly the events are registered. So uh, where it exactly registers. Um, uh, okay, so our Postgres, now we should also see uh, Table being added, All right? We just add Postgres to the Docker Compose as well. No relations yet. Cool. So, uh, so we can add Postgres to Compose, and then probably add Neo, add Neo4j to Compose, and then start looking to uh, write to Neo4j as well. Besides Postgres. Um, cool. And with this, I think we covered a lot of ground. I learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Uh, so Ashwa says, thanks a lot. We have to export all this. Then first you don't have to open any files. Yeah, we need to, we can write it directly to the database, right? And um, yeah, I don't really uh, understand. So uh, Ashwa says that we should uh, use the same query without any different like, yeah, giving a query with the distance between the symbols, characters and space and so on. Um, cool. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, this was fun. Uh, see you next time in probably two weeks or so. Next week, I'm in London for DevOps UK. And this afternoon, we're actually running a May 4th uh, session uh, with my colleagues, Jason and um, Alison, as such. Cool, cool. Take care, everyone. Uh, see you soon.